Hey everybody, I'm Ben from the Ben and Skin Show. This is my assistant, Skin, so if anybody needs a sandwich, back rub, whatever, uh, he'll get you whatever you need. Back there in the back, we see you. Um, hey, we're, we're honored to be here. Uh, I think uh, what Jamie does is incredibly special, uh, and I think people take it for granted. And uh, he's probably a lot like James Dean. When he, when he stops doing it, everybody will realize how great he was. That, did that work? Uh, I think you just predicted an early death for Jamie, but that's fine. Go with it. <laughs> Sorry, Jamie. Um, but I think Jamie, what Jamie does is fantastic, and I think it's really rare to have opportunities like this. And, you know, the, the, the entire Rangers clubhouse is full of great guys, as is the front office. So to have an assistant general manager like Thad Levine come out and answer questions, it's just incredibly valuable, and it's incredibly rare. So. Uh, we're grateful to have this opportunity and glad to be here. Now there's a microphone up here in the front, and it's a free-for-all. It's a question buffet. So grab a plate, come on up, ask Thad any question you'd like. Uh, if you have a question about the Mavericks, Skin is here. Uh, we'll be happy to answer those as well. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, we ask Thad to prepare a seven to nine minute speech, and let's have that now. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Questions. All right, a little more concise than we thought what we were originally going to get from Thad. That's okay. Uh, let me tell you, though, this is a rare opportunity uh, to present your trade ideas. So feel free to come up, embrace the mic. Uh, Thad loves to hear your trade ideas uh, because I'm sure that they haven't thought of them. They just they don't have time to think of that stuff. So use this opportunity. Oh, great. Here's someone uh, right here. And uh, by the way, if you do come up to this thing, you know, feel free, very casual. Come up, say your name, say hello, and uh, jump right in. Everyone thinks of a soundtrack in their life, and my soundtrack in my mind was much cooler than that song. <laughs> uh, but you bring up an excellent point. Does anyone here have a sense of how much we pay minor league players? It, it, it does depend on the level. First, first year minor league player will make $1,100 a month, and we pay them for five months, so you're making $5,500. So the point you made is extremely valid. You know, these guys do not make a living off of playing minor league baseball for the most part. The high-end guys in AAA, the guys with some big league experience, are probably getting paid somewhere in the neighborhood of ten dollars to $15,000 a month. You know, once again, that's a five-month scale. So even those guys are making fifty dollars to $75,000 over a five-month period. Most of these guys have to get jobs outside of playing baseball. And that's, you know, that's where we want them focused year-round of playing baseball. But financially speaking, they have to do something else. A lot of these guys go play winter ball uh, to, to earn some money in the off season. But those who are not advanced enough to play winter ball sometimes do have to take jobs. So what are some of the other things we can do? Now, in terms of what we paid minor league players, that is part of the collective bargaining agreement in terms of that first year salary of $1,100. So it's not as if as a team, we would establish a unilateral policy where we just decide to pay everybody $10,000 a month. In my personal opinion, I think this is something that should be addressed in the collective bargaining agreement. It's absurd that guys who are working in the game are getting paid that little. And if the union, see the part of the issue is most of these guys are not part of the union technically until they're on the 40 man roster. I think the union needs to take care of these guys, put some more of the collective money that is in the game into their pockets so that they're not in essence playing professional baseball and also destitute at the same time. But what things we do do to help them at the lower minor league levels, we set them up in housing so they have no housing expense. And then through the clubhouse, they can get at least two, if not three meals a day. And we've tried to invest more money in having those be more nutritious meal options. So more or less, these guys don't have to spend money on housing and food. They, they probably end up spending on one meal a day uh, if they have breakfast, but truly they can eat lunch and dinner at the ballpark every single night. And you know, it's, well, it may not be Taco Bell, it's also not as good as we do for the Major League team. You know, this, this past year, two years ago now, for the second year running, we've had a professional chef who cooks for our Major League team, and we invest a significant amount of money there. So it's not obviously that high end, but we're moving in that direction to try to make it better. Embedded in that question is that the subtext of that is, what do we do with our Latin American players who come to the United States and really have no idea how to conduct themselves? They don't know how to open a bank account. They don't know how to get on a bus. Uh, you know, they don't know how to drive cars. They don't know how to order off of menus. And we have a whole department of people headed up by Billy McLaughlin, who is bilingual. Uh, he's down in Arizona. 
designed exclusively to try to educate them not only to the language in the United States, but also to the cultures, so that they're better equipped uh, to, to really excel once they get to the United States. You know, along those lines, I'm sure there's a lot of 19 and 20 year olds that probably don't have a lot of good life experience that are suddenly on the road and playing baseball all the time. It's almost, I think, of like a, a college football team having advisors and something to help. Do you guys have those kind of folks in the organization as well? Yeah, you know, for the for the 18, you know, really 17, 18, 19, 20 year old kid who's playing rookie ball, we actually have them housed in the community with a, with a family so that they may be the first time they're away from their parents, but they have some parental guidance while they're there uh, so they can ask those types of questions. A lot of these guys have agents, some of them don't, so they can ask some life advice there, but we do have them with host families so that they can stay on the straight and narrow at least for the first couple of years until they get that experience under the belt. I think the frustration you feel is something that we all feel, and, and I think we all feel it probably more now uh, quite frankly, that maybe we felt throughout the season, despite the fact that we did have a losing streak earlier in the year, because there's something to be won right now, something to be won that hasn't been won since 1999, and it's infuriating watching the team right now make mistakes uh, where we're losing games rather than getting beaten. I think we're all willing to accept that the possible outcome in any given night is that you're going to get beaten, but unfortunately, recently, we've been beating ourselves, and, and I think that's what's uh, the least palatable when you're watching our team play. I, I would say this, that uh, our belief in our team and our faith in our ability to win the West has not changed despite the fact that we've had this five game winning streak, and a losing streak rather, and it hasn't been too pretty. Uh, and to answer your question, yes, we, we got some guys on the horizon that we're very excited about. You know, opening day, we were the second youngest team in the major leagues. So to tell you that we've got a lot of people immediately on the horizon would probably be a misrepresentation. I know Jamie could probably talk a little bit about, from a maybe a little bit more of an objective standpoint, uh, some of the guys that we, we have coming. Uh, to be fair, a lot of those guys are in the big leagues right now. You know, Some of them have come up recently between Ogando and Kirkman. That Those guys were, were parts of the, the next wave of players. Moreland, uh, guys you've seen come up this year and have contributed. But we do feel like we've got another wave coming after that. And our real goal when we designed the whole thing was that we'd have wave after wave after wave. Maybe they all won't be as strong and robust as when we had you know, effectively young Blaylock and Teixeira come all up at around the same time, but we're hopeful that they'll have, you know, you know, some stars and some just solid every, everyday major league players who will play the game the right way. But I think we do have to keep in mind that even though we have sprinkled some playoff experience into this team, the core of our team really is going through this for the first time where they're the hunted this late in September. Where, you know, we've always been the hunter, and so we're playing a new role, and I think we're all eager for them to learn how to do this as quickly as possible, uh, but I do think we have to recognize it's a learning experience as they go. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to throw that to, to Jamie. I mean, I, I'm probably a little bit more biased than maybe he is, uh, but he evaluates this for you know a lot of different clubs, and maybe he can give some perspective of some of the players that he feels are on the horizon, maybe not next year, but down the road, who he's excited about. You, got, you guys let me know if you start to roll in his eyes at any of these names. So, uh, <laughs> Offensively, there's, I think, less coming than on the mound, especially the next few years. How dare you? <laughs> I'd say uh, Angel Beltre is probably the most, the, the hitter with the highest upside that's within two or three years of the big leagues. He's a center fielder that throws like a corner outfielder, and he runs, and he has power potential. And This year is really the first year that it all started to come together, um, and he was still young for his league. Uh, he's 20? 20. 20. 20. And he was in double double A at age 20. You know, when most guys were still in college, if they if they went that route, um, he's probably I, best case scenario late next year, but probably more likely 2012. Um, as far as high end hitters, I think you got to go further down in the minor leagues when you get to a couple short stops that we signed uh, last summer out of the Latin America: uh, Jerks and Profar, Luis Sardinas. Um, high-end shortstops that are at least four-tool, if not five-tool potential. Uh, a catcher we signed out of Columbia last year, uh, Jorge Alfaro, who's 17. Obviously, he's four or five years away at best. Um, big upside there. Ton of pitching, though. I mean, you know, Thad talked about the waves. And, you know, we, we saw four or five rookies come up this year and make impacts. Next year, you'll, you know, you'll start to hear 
Andrew Shepherds and Martin Perez. We started to hear their names this year. Next year, they probably both arrive, certainly Shepherds at some point. Uh, the wave after that is probably fronted by a left-hander named Robbie Erlin, a uh, six-foot guy that doesn't pitch like a like a you know a short reliever like sometimes you, you think of Billy Wagner and guys like that that are shorter left-handers. Um, and then, you know, we, we drafted Jake Skull in the first round this year as a center fielder that, that does a little bit of everything if it all comes together, but he's also, you know, three, four years away at best. Do we have a third base when you play defense? I mean, nothing against Michael, but we, not what it was. We have a third baseman who can play outstanding defense who's been in the organization for three months named Mike Oltz, who we drafted in the second round this year, but he's three years away and he's got to prove it with the bat before he ever gets here, but he's a plus defender. Um, but I'm not going to answer the Michael Young question, I'm going to no. hand the mic back. No. One point you made which I, I don't want to gloss over is the job our player development coaches and our scouts have done has been absolutely tremendous. You know, For six of our seven teams to make the playoffs this year, which I don't think this franchise has ever done before, and I, I, quite frankly I'm not sure how many franchises have done especially in light of the fact that we have a chance to go to the playoffs in the big leagues as well, is really remarkable considering how much movement we've had throughout our system and you know, what with trading all the players we did throughout the season to try to improve our major league team and the promotions of some of our very young players. So I definitely tip my hat to all of our player development and, and scouting uh, guys. The, the question you asked about the uh, September call-ups, we, we do intend to have probably one last wave of call-ups uh, depending on how the Oklahoma City team does. We, we kind of stripped them bare, but we wanted to leave a few guys down there who we thought could benefit from getting everyday at-bats and pitching on a very consistent basis. We thought they probably would come up here and be more complimentary pieces, wouldn't play too regularly. So they're going to stay down there for the playoffs. I believe they start tonight in Memphis. And depending on how long that goes, we'll probably have one more wave of uh, call-ups at the end of it.